Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this month's video. For this month's video, I want to talk to you about uh, a condition that is uh, almost ubiquitous uh, in the general population. And uh, I want to talk to you today about the shoulder and shoulder pain. Now, this video is intended primarily for patients in my chiropractic practice. However, because this video is uh, being posted to YouTube, it will eventually be seen by people uh, all around the world. So I want to give you a little bit of an introduction uh, to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm a practicing chiropractor of almost 30 years. And those of you that are my patients, uh, you already know this. But the reason I give you that background is to let you know that uh, throughout the course of my chiropractic career, one of the most common conditions that present to the chiropractic office is shoulder pain. And uh, there's a good chance that if you're watching this video that probably at some point in your life you've probably had to deal uh, with one or more various different types of shoulder pains. <laughs> and if you've ever had pain in your shoulder, you know uh, what a pain it can be. It seems that once uh, pain sets in the shoulder, uh, it can be very uh, stubborn and very recalcitrant to treatment efforts. And one of the reasons that shoulder pains are so common to begin with and that they're so difficult to deal with is that many times, uh, unbeknownst to ourselves, we do things either repetitively uh, or singularly even, that continue to exacerbate and perpetuate the problem. And sometimes uh, one of the hardest tasks that I face as a treating chiropractor is getting it through my patients' heads <laughs> that the things that they're doing are continuing to perpetuate the problem. And I say that with a sort of a funny tone in my heart because I'm the same way myself. Sometimes uh, when I myself, with all my training and all my experience, when I myself uh, experience uh, some type of pain, uh, it seems that it takes me forever <laughs> to get it through my thick head that what I'm doing is continuing to foster and perpetuate and exacerbate and aggravate the condition. Sometimes uh, just stopping doing certain things uh, is enough to tip the scales uh, towards the healing side uh, of recovery. And so with regards to the shoulder, uh, I want to show you some things today that you could possibly be doing to aggravate your own shoulder that you may not be aware of. But if you can simply put some attention on discontinuing or at least minimizing or reducing the amount of these actions, activities, and movements that you do, uh, it'll go a long way toward preserving the longevity of your shoulder. And also, if you're having pain in your shoulder, it'll go a long way uh, toward relieving pain in your shoulder, even without uh, seeking medical treatment. So today's discussion is all about the shoulder. I want to begin by uh, going over a little bit of the anatomy of the shoulder. We're going to keep this on a layperson's level so that it stays uh, interesting and relevant to you. And after we go over the anatomy, I want to show you just one simple tip, just one simple tip that's so profound, so profound that if you just, if I can just get you uh, to implement this one simple tip, uh, it will go a long, long way towards making you a lot happier <laughs> and keeping you uh, from either developing shoulder pain in the first place, first place, or uh, relieving shoulder pain. Uh, if you've been plagued by uh, troublesome shoulder pain. Okay, so uh, that's our uh, agenda for today. Let's begin with some interesting quick facts uh, about the shoulder. Okay, so let's begin with a brief anatomy review of the shoulder. And typically when people think of the shoulder, uh, they think only of the ball and socket joint out here in the shoulder. But actually, the shoulder consists of at least four different joints, first of which is what we refer to as the sternoclavicular joint, where the collarbone comes together with the breastbone or the sternum bone. And this is an important joint because 
this is the only bone to bone attachment of the shoulder to the body. This is the only attachment that, that suspends the entire arm bone, the entire arm and the entire shoulder to the body. Okay, this is what hangs the shoulder uh, onto the body. So that's the sternoclavicular joint. And then out at the end of the clavicle, we have the acromioclavicular joint right here, where the clavicle comes together with the uh, acromion process of the scapula. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as the AC joint. Then we have the ball and socket joint out here. We refer to that as the glenohumeral joint. And then this, where the shoulder blade attaches to the rib cage in the back, that's referred to as the scapulothoracic joint. So not one, but as many as four different joints that make up the shoulder. And many times when you feel pain uh, out here in the ball and socket joint, it could be due uh, to a problem at any one or more uh, of the other three joints of the shoulder. So it's important as a diagnostician to find out uh, what is the exact cause of the pain in the shoulder. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Now, referring here to the glenohumeral joint, the ball and socket joint, uh, that is what we refer to as a ball and socket joint. And because of its anatomy of being a ball that fits into a small and shallow socket, that allows for movements uh, in many different directions which is what we refer to as multi-axial movements. Now, that makes the shoulder joint distinct from many of the other joints in the body. Most of the other joints in the body are not multi-axial joints. For example, if we take a look here at the elbow joint, the elbow joint is what's referred to as a hinge joint, and a hinge joint allows motion only in one direction movement in the, in, the in the direction of flexion, and then movement in the direction of extension. So the elbow uh, is a hinge joint. Uh, another part of the elbow that allows for uh, rotation uh, is a pivot joint, and this is what allows you to turn your wrist over. But again, even though it's a different type of a joint, it's a pivot joint versus a hinge joint, it allows only for movement uh, in one axis. In this case, it's the axis of rotation. So the shoulder is unique because of its ball and socket configuration. It allows movement forwards and backwards and left and right and also allows for uh, rotational movements around the axis of the bone. So because of its unique anatomy, uh, the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the entire body. But because it's so mobile, it has to sacrifice some stability in exchange for a wide range of mobility. In fact, stability and mobility, stability and mobility are oppositely related. In other words, joints that are very mobile are not very stable. And conversely, joints that are very stable are not very mobile. For example, if we look here at the bones of the wrist, those are what are called uh, non-axial plane joints. And they allow very little movement from bone to bone to bone to bone. Well, because there's very little movement of the individual wrist bones, the wrist itself is a fairly strong and fairly stable uh, arrangement, but the shoulder, because of its wide range of mobility that it allows, is not a very strong and not a very stable joint. And that is what gives the shoulder its great function and its great mobility, but unfortunately, that's what renders the shoulder uh, vulnerable and susceptible to frequent injury. Now, another thing that's fascinating about the shoulder is that the shoulder has many uh, muscular connections to the spine. And you've heard it said that with regards to the body, that uh, everything is connected to everything. And I want to illustrate that 
uh, as that relates to the shoulder. Now imagine this. Imagine if I asked you, uh, have you ever seen one of those um, muscular uh, posters in the doctor's office where the skin is removed from the body and it simply shows all the muscles of the body? You've probably seen those muscular uh, posters before. Well, I want you to imagine this. Imagine the backside of the uh, muscular system. And I want you to picture in your mind, you can probably picture that there are muscles that go from the spine out to the shoulder. Uh, you've probably seen those before. Well, if I was to ask you, uh, of the 24 vertebrae in the spine from the base of the skull all the way down to the tailbone and the lower back, of the 24 freely movable vertebrae in the spine, how many of those vertebrae do you think have muscular connections to the shoulder? And if I was to ask you that and you pictured in your mind those muscular poster charts that you see in the doctor's office, you might think, well, uh, I bet there's a lot. I bet there's a lot of the uh, vertebrae that are connected to the shoulder. Let's see. I bet it's a lot. Uh, of the 24, I'm going to guess about 12. Well, guess what? Of the 24 vertebrae in the spine, every single vertebrae has a connection through muscles to the shoulder. Is that incredible? Is that fascinating or what? And let me demonstrate that to you by uh, just illustrating two of the muscles uh, that connect to the spine. So the first of which is the trapezius muscle. So the trapezius muscle begins up here at the first cervical or neck vertebrae here. And it has its lowest attachment down here on the 12th thoracic vertebrae down here. And it has connections on every single vertebrae in between. And from there, it projects outwards and all of its fibers eventually attach out to the shoulder. Is that incredible? That is a total of 19 vertebrae connected by way of muscles from the spine to the shoulder through the trapezius muscle. And here we have an animation uh, that shows the trapezius muscle, which is comprised of three bands. There's an upper, upper band, a middle band, and a lower band. The upper band, uh, you'll notice, attaches on the clavicle or collarbone and a small slip out onto the scapula bone. The middle band in red uh, attaches a small piece to the collarbone and then also to the scapula bone. And then the lower band, illustrated in purple, attaches uh, to the scapula bone of the shoulder. And notice the entirety of the spinal area uh, that's covered by the trapezius muscle. Is that incredible or what? Now, the latissimus dorsi muscle, you've heard of that referred to as the lats. The latissimus dorsi muscle, illustrated here in red, you'll notice attaches here on the hip bone here on the tailbone and then on each of the lumbar spine vertebrae from L1 to L5 by way of this thick connective tissue fascia. And then from here, the latissimus dorsi, all of its fibers project upward and into the shoulder to attach on the upper arm bone very near here to the shoulder joint. So between the trapezius above and the latissimus dorsi below, every single vertebrae in the spine, all the way down to the tailbone, is connected by muscles to the shoulder. Is that incredible? And here's an animation that shows the latissimus dorsi muscle. And notice this attachment point way up high uh, on the upper arm bone, very near to uh, the joint of the shoulder. And it's quite interesting, uh, I once had a patient who was 
uh, in some physical training to test for acceptance into a, a local police department. And one of the exercises that he was required to be able to perform uh, was the chin-up. And so he was practicing his chin-ups. And it was interesting because he developed pain down in his hip as a result of doing chin-ups. And what happened was, because he was a large and muscular uh, man, he actually pulled his hip out of place. He pulled his hip out of place through the contraction of his latissimus dorsi muscle up at the shoulder. And so the point of showing you all of these muscular connections to the shoulder is to just emphasize the point that if any vertebrae of the spine is out of place, and in the case of the latissimus dorsi, even if the hip is out of place, even if the tailbone is out of place, if any one of those spinal bones are out of place, that can result in pain in the shoulder. And many times there's actually no problem actually with the shoulder, but rather the pain in the shoulder is coming uh, from some distant site in the spine. And it could be in the neck, it could be in the mid back, could be in the lower back. So the point is, if you're having a chronic shoulder pain that does not seem to be going away with uh, care and conservative measures, it could be that there's no problem with the shoulder at all, but that the problem is coming from some site even distant or remote from the shoulder. And I want to illustrate this point and really drive this message home uh, a little bit more. So let's talk about some of the other causes uh, of shoulder pain. And there are many, many causes of shoulder pain. As we said, any condition of the neck, the mid back, the low back uh, can refer pain out to the shoulder. Uh, any misalignment of the sternum bone or the collarbone uh, can result in symptoms out in the shoulder. And by symptoms, I mean clicking, popping, pain, skipping, weakness, uh, weak, weak uh, part of the range of motion, which we refer to as a painful arc. Any kind of symptom uh, in the shoulder can be coming simply from the sternum or the collarbone being out of place. Uh, shoulder pain can be the result of uh, painful jaw conditions, such as uh, temporomandibular joint disorders. And if you've ever had a temporomandibular joint disorder, it's not very long because, before you notice uh, symptoms also in the shoulder. And again, this is another example uh, of the many muscular connections that run down the front and back of the neck to connect structures uh, in the head, neck, and face with uh, structures in the shoulder. Uh, muscle imbalances can be a cause of shoulder pain. And this is something that we commonly encounter in our society because people are hunched over computers. People are doing uh, chronic activities with their hands in front of their body rather than behind their body. And so we develop these imbalances around the shoulder uh, that gradually cause the shoulder to uh, break down. Believe it or not, even poorly supported arches in the feet can cause symptoms in the shoulder. And you'll notice that we've skipped all the way from the neck all the way down to the bottoms of the feet to illustrate problems uh, that can uh, manifest themselves as pain in the shoulder. And I want to tell you a story uh, to help illustrate how everything in the body uh, is connected and no, no, no more, nowhere does this apply more than uh, with the shoulder. So I wonder how many of you recognize uh, this character here. This is a former baseball player known as Dizzy Dean, Dizzy Dean. And Dizzy Dean was a baseball pitcher. And uh, the story of Dizzy Dean illustrates the principle that everything in the body is connected. In fact, if we consider all the joints of the body, the joints of the body form what we refer to as a kinematic chain, a kinematic chain. And what that means is that every link in the chain is connected to every other link. And every link has to move properly for the chain itself to move properly. Well, Dizzy Dean was a baseball pitcher. 
And one day, Dizzy Dean developed a pain in his big toe. He had a hangnail on his big toe. And so what they did was they cut out the hangnail. They wrapped the toe in a big bandage and they put him in an oversized shoe so that he wouldn't have pain. And he, and he felt a lot better and he was doing a lot better. But when he pushed off the mound with his foot, he still found that he had some pain in his big toe. And so in order to be able to throw a fastball, he found that since he was not able to push off his big toe as much as he otherwise would, he had to generate a little bit more force in the knee. And he had to create a little bit more torque in the hips. And he had to apply a little bit more force through his shoulder than he otherwise would have. And as a result, he unfortunately threw his shoulder out. And that's what ended the career of Dizzy Dean. And the moral of this story is that any problem in the body can manifest itself as pain in the shoulder. And that's the job of the diagnostician is to find out where is the cause of the pain in the shoulder. So for you, if you're having a chronic recurring pain in the shoulder that just does not seem uh, to be getting better when it should, it could be that your problem is not in the shoulder. It could be that your problem uh, is at the knee. It could be that your problem is a poorly supported arch. It could be that there's something out of place in the lower back. That's the job of the doctor is to make the accurate diagnosis so that the treatment can be correctly directed uh, at the true source of the problem. So I'm going to give you some suggestions about how to take care of your shoulder in this video, but the, one of the themes that I want to reinforce here with this slide is if you have a pain that is not going away, that could require uh, an office visit for an accurate diagnosis. Okay? Okay, so let's get into our lesson for today and our take-home message. And uh, I want to illustrate uh, one of the basic functions of the shoulder. And in order for you to understand that, uh, I just want to draw your attention to some of the configurations of the bones uh, of the shoulder. So on the left here, we have the shoulder from the back. And on the right here, we have the shoulder from the front. So the shoulder uh, here uh, consists of three bones. We have the collarbone, we have the scapula bone, and we have the humerus bone. Collarbone, scapula bone, humerus bone. Now with regards to the humerus bone, I want to draw your attention to this large protuberance, this large prominence of bone that sticks out from the top of the humerus bone. We refer to this large prominence as the greater tubercle, the greater tubercle. So this is the greater tubercle here, and then this is the lesser tubercle here. Now, many of the problems that we encounter in the shoulder are simply a result of this greater tubercle, this greater tubercle. So I want to show you how the greater tubercle contributes to shoulder pains. Now, one of the most common conditions that we see uh, with regards to the shoulder is a condition known as shoulder impingement syndrome, impingement syndrome. And you can Google that term if you want more uh, information about shoulder impingement syndrome. And what happens with shoulder impingement syndrome is that this greater tubercle right here gets compressed and jammed up into this space underneath this shelf of bone right here. This is known as the acromion process and the greater tubercle can get jammed up in there when we move our arm in certain angles and in certain positions. So from the front, you can see that this greater tubercle moves up and under this arch when we raise our arm over our head. And that can compress structures that travel through this narrow space in here. And that gives us a condition that we refer to as shoulder impingement syndrome. So what are some of those structures? 
Well, here we see a cross section uh, of the shoulder. Here is the greater tubercle here. This prominence of bone that sticks off of the uh, bone itself. And here we see underneath this arch of bone here, we see compression on this structure here, which is a bursa sac. And you've heard of the term of shoulder bursitis. Sometimes you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, I, the doctor said I had bursitis. And here shows a compression and an inflammation uh, of the bursa as it passes underneath this arch. Now imagine if this prominence of bone of the greater tubercle was to rotate up and under there and really compress that bursa. Here we see the arm hanging at its side, but when the arm goes out to the side and overhead, this greater tubercle here comes up and underneath this arch and compresses the bursa. In addition to the bursa passing through this area, we also have the tendon. The tendon here, this is tendon of this muscle, which is one of the rotator cuff muscles. So sometimes you go to the doctor and the doctor will tell you that you have uh, rotator cuff tendonitis. And this is an illustration here of rotator cuff tendonitis. Well, imagine what happens to that tendon. and Imagine what happens uh, to this space, this narrow space in here, when this large prominence of bone comes up and under there and compresses all the structures up against these two bony surfaces, this surface here and this surface here. We refer to that as shoulder impingement syndrome. So I want to give you a little demonstration uh, about the greater tubercle and how the greater tubercle contributes to shoulder impingement syndrome. And then I'll tell you how to guard against ever developing shoulder impingement syndrome. Okay, so I want to give you a little demonstration as to what happens when we move our arms in the high-risk position, and what happens up into the shoulder. Now, the high-risk position for the shoulder involves internal rotation of the shoulder with elevation to the side at 90 degrees and above or elevation to the front at 90 degrees or above. Now, when we turn our arms into internal rotation, that big knob of bone, the greater tubercle, moves in such a position that it can jam up underneath that small space that I demonstrated. And so, just to demonstrate this to you, when I move my arm in internal rotation, I can raise my shoulder at about 90 degrees of elevation, but no higher. And the reason it goes no higher is because that large knob of bone is now compressed and locked bone on bone up in the shoulder. It's locked. There's a bone on bone lock. Now, if I want to raise my arm above 90 degrees, I can do it. But notice that the arm is not moving. The only reason that the arm is going above 90 degrees is because the shoulder blade in the back is moving. There's no freedom here at the joint in the shoulder joint. That's locked. But the shoulder blade underneath is moving. Once I get to 90 degrees, it's locked. Now notice if I then take my arm and put it in external rotation, external rotation, the lock clears and I can now freely raise my arm. There's magic in external rotation there's danger in internal rotation. So what I'm going to show you uh, in the next several slides are a series of activities and a series of positions that we get, in our, get ourselves into uh, in our activities of daily living and in our exercise routines uh, that serve as continual sources of aggravation uh, to our shoulder pains. So I demonstrate these to you to help illustrate some of the common activities that perpetuate shoulder problems. And uh, I bring these up to illustrate to you where you can start to look 
for improvements in your daily living activities to help rehabilitate any shoulder pain uh, that may be chronically plaguing you. Okay, so take a look at this gal. How many of you ever uh, unload groceries? Well, all of us unload groceries. Look at the position of her shoulder. She has her arm in internal rotation. Notice it's in internal rotation. And then she's lifting her arm up to 90 degrees or more in order to get the groceries out of this bag. Well, notice her hand is down about here right now, getting apples and what have you. In order for her hand come up and clear the top of this bag, she's going to have to raise her shoulder up even higher. And that's going to cause impingement syndrome here at the shoulder. Now that's not going to kill you one time. That's not going to kill you to do that two times. But if you do it repetitively, and especially if you do it with load down here on the hand, load, then very quickly uh, the shoulder can develop pain. So this is the high risk positions, internal rotation with flexion to the front greater than 90 degrees or internal rotation with movement to the side. We refer to that as abduction with movement to the side greater than 90 degrees. So this will be an example of a high risk activity. Best to just dump these groceries down on the countertop and pick them up one by one rather than have to lift them up over the height of this bag. Okay, what else? Well, how about this gal? Lifting above 90 degrees with her shoulders in internal rotation under load, under load. Here she has about a 10, 12, 15 pound baby uh, loading down on her shoulder. How about this gal here? Notice that she has her arm at 90 degrees to her torso and that her upper arm is in internal rotation under load. Here she's carrying a huge load. And this is the type of thing that can acutely uh, pop the shoulder out of place, can give the shoulder an acute sharp pain, or can contribute uh, to chronic shoulder pain due to repetitive motions. Again, notice the high risk position is with the shoulder in internal rotation and elevation greater than 90 degrees. With this gal here, 90 degrees would be right about here. She's actually at about 165 degrees. Okay, high risk. You want to keep your shoulder below 90 degrees if it's going to be in a position of internal rotation. Okay, what about sleeping positions? <laughs> I know all of us would love to get a good night's sleep, but many of us cannot get a good night's sleep because of pain in the shoulder. And some of us, even if we are sleeping well, uh, we notice that our shoulder pain is just not going away. And many times that's due to the fact that we're sleeping on it wrong. Now remember, I said that the high risk position is with the shoulder in internal rotation and flexed greater than 90 degrees. Well, this gal's arm relative to her torso is flexed to approximately 150 or even 180 degrees. 90 degrees would be out here and below. Here would be the maximum. Here she's at about 180 degrees. She has her arm straight overhead. Notice also that she has her palm here, palm down relative to her body. That's a position of internal rotation of the shoulder. So she's in the high risk position here. And then she's compounding this, <laughs> compounding this by having the weight of her head and the weight of her body compressing down on her shoulder, which is somewhere 
right about in here. And it, let me tell you, let me tell you, listen to this carefully. This comes from 30 years experience of treating thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. If you have a shoulder pain and you sleep on it like this, that shoulder pain will never go away. Did I say never? <laughs> it will never go away because you're continuing to aggravate it in the impingement position. You're continuing to compress those delicate structures. And no matter how much therapy, no matter how much chiropractic, no matter how many bursitis injections you get, that pain will not go away if you continue to sleep. So what is the right way to sleep? Well, here is a better way to sleep. And let me point out why it's better. Okay, number one, notice that here she has her palm up. Palm is facing up. This is a position of external rotation of the shoulder. If she was to rotate her hand all the way around this way, that would be internal rotation. But she's in a position of external rotation, and that is good. Notice that the position of her upper arm relative to her torso is at about 90 degrees or even less. It looks to me like it's even less. 90 degrees would be if her elbow was probably right about here. Okay, but she's her elbows right about here and her upper arm is going back this way. So she's below 90 degrees and she's in external rotation. She's not pinching those delicate structures up in the shoulder. Now, if you have a sore shoulder, you can take this sleeping position and make it even better. And that would be to take this shoulder here and lean it back backwards away from this shoulder here. In other words, the more closed down this angle in here becomes, the greater the pressure on the shoulder. So she's doing good by sleeping uh, with her palm up and with the elbow below the 90 degree position. She could do even better by rolling backwards a little bit, perhaps by putting a pillow back here that she can lean upon in order to uh, further take pressure off of the shoulder. So this is the proper way to sleep here. This, this position of sleeping over here will eventually kill the shoulder. It just grinds it right down into a pulp. And people who continue to sleep like this uh, will say things like, uh, I get woken up in the middle of the night by my shoulder. Uh, I can't sleep because my shoulder hurts. Uh, I can't sleep on my left side. <laughs> because it bothers my shoulder. And when I said in the beginning of this video that sometimes it takes a long time to just get these concepts through our head that sometimes what we're doing uh, continues to aggravate and exacerbate our conditions. And this is an example. When someone says to me, uh, it hurts like heck when I sleep on the left side of my body, what's the answer to that? Don't sleep on the left side of your body. Don't do that. You're aggravating it. You're making it worse. Get off the left side of your body. Okay? And, and sleep is so critical. The sleeping positions are so critical. Sometimes when, uh, when uh, people tell me about their shoulder pain, I ask them, well, are you married? And they'll say, well, yes, I am. And I say, well, you're going to, let me see. Let me see which side of the bed. You, it's your right shoulder that's hurting you, right? <clears throat> well, I bet you're sleeping on the left side of the bed. And they'll say, well, yep, that's right. And I tell them, well, you have to switch sides with your wife or you have to go to the guest room or you have to do something. You have to change the sleeping position or the shoulder will never get well. OK. Well, many times people say, well, can I, are there some exercises that I can do uh, that will help my shoulder? And yes, there are. But even more important. Uh, are some exercises not to do if you have a shoulder pain. And I want to illustrate this principle with a story. Uh, one time I myself, uh, I was having pain in my knee. And uh, this story goes back about 10 or 15 years or so. 
and I had some pain and swelling on one of my knees and uh, it just was not going away and I tried to do some things uh, to help it and I used the best of my knowledge and I used uh, the tools that I had available in my chiropractic practice and I gave it some therapy and it just wasn't going away and uh, so I consulted with an oriental medical doctor and this guy was about a uh, hundred years old <laughs> and had been doing it for about 85 of those years and uh, he was very wise healer and I was telling him about my pain in my knee and he said to me he said well what are you doing what are you what are you doing what do you like to do and I said well uh, well I play hockey I play ice hockey uh, two to three nights a week he said yeah what else I said oh I like to lift weights in the gym and so I do leg press and squats and all kinds of leg exercises about uh, two three times a week and he said yeah I said what else I said, well, uh, I like to ski, and I like to go skiing uh, once or twice a week. He said, uh-huh, I understand. And then he said something to me that was so profound. It, it impacted me and my practice as a chiropractor uh, from that day forward. And he said, uh, I'll give you a treatment. He said, I'm happy to give you a treatment. But I'll tell you that if you continue doing all that activity, it's not going to get better because the sum total of all those activities combined was slowly overwhelming my knee and causing my knee to be angry and inflamed and no amount of treatment in the world is going to overcome all of the abuse that I was giving my knee as a result of the combination of those three intensive activities ice hockey heavy leg workouts downhill skiing and so Similarly, if you're doing these exercises that I'm going to show you, and many of you do go to the health club, uh, if you're doing these exercises, your shoulder will never get better. In fact, it will only get worse. One of the worst exercises is the upright row. Now, notice the position here at the shoulder. The shoulder is in internal rotation. See the palms down, palms down position. The elbow is elevated above the shoulder. So this would be 90 degrees or below. This is 90 degrees or above. So he's at about 115 degrees of shoulder elevation. He's got his soft tissues pinched right here. From about this point on up, he's jamming, jamming, jamming the bursa and the rotator cuff tendon all the while under the load of this weight and if these are real weights of any kind this is about 135 pounds total he's doing upright rows it won't be very long where he won't be able to do this exercise at all because this is a high risk exercise what about dumbbell side laterals again high risk exercise i do not recommend this as an exercise and if you're doing this exercise with the hope that it's going to rehabilitate your shoulder it will not it will only make your shoulder worse because it grinds 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 on the shoulder notice got the elbow elevated above shoulder level palm down with the shoulder in internal rotation this is going to contribute to shoulder impingement syndrome some people like to do uh, dumbbell front raises. Again, notice palm down with the elbow above the level of the shoulder. Greater than 90 degrees of elevation is going to jam the greater tubercle into the bursa and the tendon of the rotator cuff. So remember, those high risk position involves internal rotation of the shoulder with elevation of the arm above 90 degrees above 90 degrees this is 90 degrees and below this is 90 degrees and above and that 90 degrees means out to the side or out to the front of the body in either flexion or side which is abduction okay so i hope you are clear now 
what I want you to do is I want you to think about your daily activities. Are there activities that you're involved with that include internal rotation of the shoulder with elevation above 90 degrees? If so, I want you to start to be able to first to identify those movements. First is identify, and then number two is to eliminate or reduce the total amount or the reduce the frequency uh, of those movements that you perform. If you can first get it in your mind what it is that you're doing and what types of activities are the high risk maneuvers and then secondarily start to reduce and eliminate those maneuvers, you're going to notice that pain in your shoulders, pain and clicking and clunking and jumping and weak spots and sharp pains, uh, they're going to start getting better and you're going to start being uh, a lot happier uh, when you're able to do your activities uh, without pain. Okay, so let's set a goal for 2015 and that is uh, to use our shoulder properly and to discontinue using the shoulder improperly. And that begins by first taking note, taking note uh, of those high risk positions and high risk maneuvers and movements uh, that you do unknowingly most of the time. And let me give you a clue as to uh, when you may be engaging uh, in these high risk maneuvers. Many times when you experience pain in your shoulder, it's because you've gotten yourself into one of these high risk movements. So many times uh, you'll hear people say, um, uh, I can't lift stuff into the top shelf in my kitchen because that hurts my shoulder. Or in the gym, people will say, uh, I can't do that exercise because uh, that causes me pain in my shoulder. Well, there's the clue. <laughs> the reason those positions cause pain in the shoulder, most commonly, there are exceptions, but most commonly is because they involve internal rotation of the shoulder with elevation above 90 degrees. And like I said, this is not intuitive. Nobody tells you this. But you actually know it because you know those are the times when you experience pain. And sleep is another great example. People will say, uh, well, I can't, I can't sleep on my side because that just kills my shoulder. The reason it kills the shoulder is because it involves internal rotation with elevation more than 90 degrees. So the first step in getting over shoulder pain is to first stop doing things that are continuing to exacerbate and aggravate the problem. And uh, this video gives you uh, the single greatest cause of the most common shoulder condition uh, that we encounter in the day-to-day -day chiropractic and medical practice. So uh, I hope that helps you and I hope you uh, set this as a goal for 2015. Again, uh, one of the themes of this video is that if you have a shoulder pain that's not going away, it could be that the problem is not in the shoulder at all. It could be coming from some other part of the body, and that requires uh, an expert diagnosis. So for those of you that are my patients, if you're having shoulder pain, make sure to let me know about it, and I'll give it a good look and find out uh, what needs to be done or what should be done uh, in order to get rid of that pain. If th For those of you out in Cyberland watching this video, uh, if you have a chronic shoulder pain, uh, the information in this video is not intended as a substitute for a professional medical diagnosis. So always seek uh, medical care for any pain uh, that does not resolve in a reasonable period of time. So this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I want to thank you for joining me on today's video. I look forward to being with you on our next video. And for now, I'm wishing you uh, best of success and health in 2000.